Welcome to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Scott, and together we will dive into the lives and careers of the jazz legends who have left a rhythmic imprint on the world. Be prepared to reminisce on the highs and the lows of their musical journey and the trials that sculpted their timeless musical gems. We'll preserve the legacy of these extraordinary maestros and find inspiration in the melodies of their lives. Subscribe now and never miss a beat. Now, let's get to the show. song called crush that's the latest from our guest who has who's a producer he's a composer he's he does everything I, what he doesn't do we're going to find out today ladies and gentlemen <laughs> welcome to blake aaron blake how are you today i'm doing great thanks for having me daryl appreciate no, it not a problem and, and one of the things i, I want to get started with your background and so forth and so on when did you start playing saxophone and what brought you to the sax well, I'm actually a guitar player. Oh, guitar player. My, my mistake. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, see, guitar. wow, what brought me to it? I think, you know, when I was a, a little kid, my, uh, uh, my dad and brother played, but just, you know, a little bit uh, here and there. So that's what initially brought me into it. But then, you know, very soon after that, I started uh, getting into uh, jazz and uh, even in high school got into the... Uh, uh, high school jazz band and then even while in high school started playing with the college jazz bands and then you know started uh, playing in all kinds of other different genres as well like uh, you know rock bands and funk bands and that started doing tv and film and so it just kind of took off from there is it is it tough to go from one genre to another when you were doing you know the rock band and you go to a jazz band and you go to whatever is it tough to adjust your playing to that type of music? It can be. I mean, there's definitely a lot of guys that, you know, approach uh, jazz like a rock player or, or approach rock like a jazz player, and you really need to be able to uh, change gears, you know? And fortunately, I've been blessed with, you know, hanging around enough people in different genres that, you know, I try to make sure that, you know, uh, I approach jazz like a jazz player, approach rock like a rock player, pro approach blues like a blues player. I mean, it really is kind of a different thing. And, you know, some people, I've heard some people say like, well, if you know jazz, you know everything. And that's, I mean, I get the concept as far as Sure, maybe theory-wise, maybe harmonically, I get it. But uh, every um, genre has its own thing. So that's not really true. If you know jazz, it's fantastic. But there's still uh, there's still the emotional parts of blues and rock that are special to blues and rock. There's still approaches. There's still stylistic things that are uh, that are very specific to each genre that you have to really experience in order to play them and um you know have the audience receive that uh effectively how do you how do you i mean do you study rock do you study jazz i guess my main question is just that adjustment if somebody calls you and says hey this weekend uh i got this rock band and i need you to play are you well versed in it now that you can maybe walk on a set a couple hours beforehand and rehearse a couple of songs and just go out and play? Oh, I am now, sure. Okay. I mean, I've done so many <laughs> rock gigs in my life that, yeah, I mean, is it, sure, if the music is incredibly complex, then, you know, I might need a little bit more time than that. But, you know, if the, if the music is somewhat uh, straight ahead, then, yeah, I'm to the point where I can pretty much, especially if it's, uh, you know, because I can also read music. So if it's written down, then that's uh, I've actually shown up, you know, five minutes before the gig and just read the read the gig down. So, I mean, 
uh, and, and definitely that that's happened because, you know, guys get sick or guys can't make it or whatever. Uh, matter of fact, I also play at church and that's how I got, uh, one of the church gigs is, um, uh, somebody couldn't make it and it was, the concert was in an hour. And so I just showed up and I just read the, I read it down and, and then they, uh, hired me to, is a actually kind of a big church at the time called, uh, Saddleback Church out in, um, in Orange County. So I actually ended up playing there for eight years because of that one gig that I showed up and just read it down. And that was all kinds of different music. That was, uh, you know, praise and gospel. It was rock. It was the, what they call CCM, contemporary Christian, uh, ministry. So, um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it really, you get to the point where you've done enough of these uh, where you can kind of just show up and, and, and play if you have the, kind of the experience of doing all those different genres. How, how long have you been playing? When did you start? Uh, I was about seven when I started. I didn't really you know, take it seriously until I was about 14 in high school, and that was when I started, you know, I just... <laughs> I mean, I guess I was kind of naive in the sense that I just kept throwing myself into situations that I had no idea what I was doing, but it was just kind of a sink or swim kind of situation. So same thing with, you know, when I was in high school and I just decided I'd be in the jazz band and you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I never played jazz before. So, but I just figured it out. Same thing when I went into the college jazz bands when I was still in high school and then I did all these funk bands uh, coming out of college, you know, I had, I'd never been in these situations before, and but you know, you have to figure it out really quick. Otherwise, you don't you don't last. Mm -hmm. and, and and you've lasted, and your work is is very good. Now, in in the beginning, you're a side man. You're a, I call him a session artist. How how'd you get? How'd you gravitate to? I don't know, doing TV shows, doing music. Do you just go in and audition and they go, okay, we'll pick that guy? Um, Sometimes, yeah. Oh, sorry, really, go ahead. No, I, I just, is it that simple? It can be. I mean, it does, you know, there is a lot of politics involved. It is, you know, who you know sometimes. I mean, I, I can, tr it's funny because I can trace back everything, that, even that I'm doing today from like years ago, uh, meeting some person in some weird situation. Like all the TV and film stuff that I've ever done goes back to one time that I was decided I was going to go into um, Hollywood and there was this place called Musicians Contact Service. I think they still have it online now, but at that time you actually went in in person and filled out like a resume. It was almost like a wow. like a headhunter place that they have for you know executives, but they did this for musicians back in the time and they would have auditions you know, from big touring acts uh, at the time to top 40 bands. I mean, it'd be the whole the whole rundown. So I just happened to be there and I was filling out um, this whole long application and there was somebody else there that was um, looking for, and I could just overhear them because they were really loud when they were right. uh, filling out. They were looking for a guitar player for a video. And I, you know, I don't know why I just, you know, normally I'm a pretty, not that I'm shy at all. I'm, I'm not, I'm outgoing, but in business situations, I normally don't just say, you know, Hey, look at me, hire me. Right, right. But, um, I, uh, I just, for some reason had the feeling that I was just going to go over and say, pardon me for interrupting. I just couldn't help overhearing, uh, that you guys need a guitar player for a video. And, um, they, we started talking right then and there, and they said, well, sure, why don't you come down and do this video? Well, it, what's funny is that turned out to be nothing. It ended up being this <laughs> terrible video that I was, wasn't was uh, proud of, but he ended up being a uh, the guy who did the video, a friend of a up-and-coming TV and film composer, and he was a keyboard player, and he was auditioning... Um, himself for writing for a cop show at the time but it was guitar oriented and he was a keyboard player so he wanted to collaborate with a guitar player so he introduced me we got together we wrote for this cop show that didn't end up taking off so you, you think okay well you know 
why keep going when these things keep not being successful. But then he ended up getting the composing gig with um, Ben Stiller for the Ben Stiller show, Sunday Night Comics, uh, Mad TV, if you remember that show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I ended up being the guitar player for all those shows. Did you get frustrated in the beginning? I mean, you know, you go just from the two stories that you mentioned, you go over two. Do you do you put your head down and just go, I, I can't do this. It's not going to work. Or do you go, I'm going to get in this and I'm going to do this no matter what? You know, I, I kind of have that personality. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of guys that have given up. I mean, I've seen a lot of my friends. uh that have uh, that have given up, but fortunately, I always had something to keep me going. So, you know, you always have a lot of irons in the fire. So, at the same time that um, I was, you know, auditioning for this, I was still doing other gigs, still mm-hmm. doing, you know, maybe teaching at the time, or I, mean, I always had something going on, and I couldn't ever imagine myself. I think the last. I mean, I never really even had a day job, but I mean, even side job that wasn't music, uh, I might have been, you know, in my early 20s or something. I think I waited tables when I was 22. I think that was the last wow. time I had a, a job other than music. That's always the, the, the strange thing to me when there's downtime. And I'm not exactly sure what downtime is for musicians, but of, of all the people I'm trying to get a hold of now, I sometimes I get won't do press while on tour and i get it i really do sure but when there's when you try to fit into that schedule when there's no downtime what what are you doing Uh, you're playing side gigs you're playing maybe local clubs what what is it that you're doing to keep yourself occupied and also to keep keep your chops going to keep playing and, and 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 experiment and do whatever uh, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, when I'm out on the road doing stuff, uh, yeah, I'm always still, uh, a lot of guys take laptops with them and still do production work while in a hotel. Uh, I've done that. I've taken my laptop. Uh, I was mentioning to you earlier that I'm, uh, also teaching music at a university a couple of days a week. And, uh, when I'm on the road, um, I have to teach it from my hotel room. So I've done that. Uh, so yeah, you're always kind of doing something. When do you rest? <laughs> um, <laughs> I do, uh, you know, I, I have to find time now because I have a, a wife and two kids. So, uh, oh. got to find time in there someplace to be with the, be with the family. Got to learn how to budget that time. Um, there was a gentleman who was just here, um, for a concert, Najee. And, oh, I, and, I, and I read that Najee good friend. has a good quote. Uh, you're one of the greatest treasures as a guitarist. How does that make you feel? Uh, I mean, it feels great. I mean, Najee is, uh, is amazing. As a matter of fact, I didn't even ask him for that quote. Um, I, I think it was on iTunes or something. You know, you release a uh, new album. I think it was Color and Passion at the time. And, you know, for the first month or so, you're watching to see the reviews come in from either just fans or from publications. Uh, We have a publicist and all that. And I was looking at my iTunes reviews, and uh, there I saw one of the greatest uh, treasures as a guitarist. And, Najee, whoa, I didn't know he... So I actually called him. I said, man, that was very nice of you. Thank you so much. And uh, he said, oh, sure, man. I, you know, I meant it. I said, well... I know I never asked you for a quote, but can I use that? And he said, absolutely. So I've been uh, using it ever since. So that that was uh, unsolicited. Nice. That, that's awfully nice. Okay, we're going to take a, we're going to pause for a second because we want to hear some of your music upcoming. We've got the song Movers and Shakers. So let's take a listen to that and we'll be back. <laughs> influences growing up do you still have influences uh, sure who, who are some of your influencers 
I mean, I kind of um, went back backwards in time because, you know, when I was a kid, I was only exposed to what my friends were exposed to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started with uh, rock music, you know, and so I was into all the rock bands at the time, you know, I was, I was always into or, or rock bands before me as well. So, I mean, I think, uh, um, you know, Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Queen and, and all the, all the rock bands. So that was the initial uh, influences on all the rock players that were with them. But then, you know, as I started getting into jazz, um, people would say, you know, have you checked out this guy? Have you checked out that guy? So I started with guys that were kind of rock, but had a little bit of jazz in them, like Jeff Beck, and then more fusion guys like Larry Carlton and Lee Rittenauer. And then somebody introduced me to Pat Metheny and then George Benson. And then it was like, well, if you like those guys, you know, you got to check out the guy who started it all, which was West Montgomery. And then if you like West Montgomery, you know, there's horn players out there, too. It's not just guitar players. How about, you know, Miles Davis? How about John Coltrane? How about Charlie Parker? How about, uh, you know, and then this was this whole new world that just opened up for me. It was like, right. whoa, you know, I never knew all this existed, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. How did you incorporate those mentors those influencers into your own style you know i mean i think i have i mean it, it's funny i it's i teach exactly that to my students because some students will say um you know aren't if i just transcribe and copy licks aren't i gonna just gonna be i won't have my own personality and i said no that's actually not true at all the best players um, have said, as a matter of fact, there's a great quote. It may have been from Max Roach. I'm not. Sure. I'm trying to remember who said this, but uh, who said everything you need to know about music is in your living room, and it's that's actually true because you know back then it was you, know, you had records in your living room, and really, if you sit down with records and you transcribe all that stuff, which is not easy and takes a lot of time. But if you sit down and you transcribe all that stuff, that really is everything you need to know about music. I mean, sure, you can have teachers, you can have professors, you can go to school, you can hang out, you can have all these 100%. But um, really, the experience of getting to know music is in those records. So, I mean, I took that seriously. So I remember, you know, especially back when I first started spending lots of time just writing out licks from guitar players. And then I got into horn players trying to figure out how do I make a horn lick work on guitar. And what I tell my students is don't worry about copying people because eventually it will come out you because no one's going to take the same exact combination of players and and by the way every this is how all the greats learned if you you know if you whatever hear interviews with uh john coltrane he he listened to guys and transcribed licks but it it, it came out him later i mean uh pat Metheny, same way uh george benson had his guys that he listened to uh rock players same way i mean you know the uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan will said that he listened to Jimi Hendrix all the time. That's where, and you can hear it. You can hear it in his playing, but yet nobody sounds like Stevie Ray Vaughan because no one will take that information and digest it in the same way that he will. And eventually what you pick and choose, and this works for me, that works for me. And what if I put this together? And what if I mix that together? And what if I do this and, and put my sensibilities to it? It will come out you specifically as your personality i mean it, it what i tell my students is it's, it's like learning a language i mean really in the beginning of course you're just going to mimic exactly what people say but eventually it comes out as you you will communicate in your own way just like when you learn a language people know it's you even though in the beginning you imitated people word for word do your students challenge you from the standpoint of I can do what you're doing or I'm not sure if I can create the same sound that you have, but is there a, is there ever like a competition between student and teacher? <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I've had students for sure that um, make sure, yeah, I got to make sure I'm on my toes, 
you know, students that are, uh, I have a couple students now at the university that, you know, are really good. They're gigging. They're already gigging. They're already out there doing stuff. So I got to make sure that, you know, I'm on my toes and not just showing them stuff that's either incorrect or stuff that they already know. Do, do you go out and see them and are you a fan or are you an instructor listening? Uh, I mean, I can be both for sure. I mean, they, they'll bring in what, what, sometimes I'll give them assignments to record actually what they're doing and bring it in. And yeah, they're, they're recording great stuff. I just had a student, uh, matter of fact, I was just at the university yesterday um, and he brought in um, a, a recording that he did and produced uh, with his band and it's really good. It was, you know, it was professional. Are you going to take it, make it a, make it a single and, and tell him to go out and do his thing? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it was more in the pop genre, oh, but, okay. uh, but it was, but yeah, it's really, uh, it was really good. One of the things you do is, is you're a producer and, and I always, I struggle with this. So somebody comes in, says, I want you to produce my, my music. How do, you, how do you two find a common ground that you respect and can work with as opposed to you maybe trying to take your stuff and influence them? What's the process of working? No, that's, a, that's a great question because I, I do have a lot of um, clients that come in and they'll say, you know, are you going to write a song for me? And I I have done that, but I try to avoid completely doing that i like to at least start with one of their ideas even if i end up writing 75 percent of it at least if i can start with one of their ideas because i want to make sure that what i produce is them that it's not me um because that's at least the what i believe is to be the best producer is making that artist into the best them that they can be as opposed to making them into the best me that they can be if that makes sense yes, it does. Um, so i mean i'm hesitant to totally just go here's my song play it play it like me play it like this and produce it because then it's just then you're not really doing your job as a producer i don't think uh, how often are you producing how many okay we'll use last year 2023 how many songs did you produce last year? Including my own or just other artists? Uh, other artists. Um, other artists. Um, I didn't actually do that many last year. I think I did five or six um, last, last year. Uh, I have more scheduled uh, this year. I'm trying to balance that out between, you know, because I have a record coming out and doing right. my own stuff. And then I'm touring and I'm also teaching. And, you know, like you said, have to spend a little time with the family and stuff. Um so yeah, I'm I'm trying not to uh, go too far into being a producer because then I start to sacrifice my own career as an artist. That, your time management skills must be wonderful. <laughs> well, thanks, I appreciate that, but uh, uh, I'm not sure my wife would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, it's just okay. I heard this from somebody else. He puts the kids to bed, then he goes down in the basement, and that's when he works on his songs. But then, when do you work on the people that you're producing? Right. You know, it, it, it's it, it's almost like, okay, on Monday I'm going to do this, on Tuesday I'm going to do this, on Wednesday I'm going to do this. And once the phone rings, that plans out the door. Uh, yep. Or, or somebody's got a question, or 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 as you are working on something that you're doing, something triggers in your head that you want to do for you. Do you ever come up with something and go, that's not for me. I'm going to give it to whoever I'm working with. Um, I, I have before. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple of times where, um, someone has brought something in for me to, uh, produce and, uh, I just, you know, didn't feel that I could come out with a really good product with that, with that artist. And I've, uh, but I usually try if I can. Um, cause you, usually the, the artists are, um, I don't advertise. So they're, uh, by referral. So, um, 
you know, I'm trying not to let down either, uh, like my radio promoter will refer a lot of clients to me or other clients will refer clients to me. So I'll try to do, uh, whatever I can, uh, to help them. But there's been a couple of times where I've had to just go, I don't think I can do anything with this. I, I'm, I'm going to bring up a, a jealousy thing that I have with musicians. It's not you. It's just musicians. <laughs> you have an unfair advantage when it comes to relationships. Because you can, you can play a song, you can create a song, you can do that. I, I can't do that. Everybody thinks whatever. But that's the unfair advantage. Now, I understand that you wrote a song, She's the One, which is for your wife. I yeah. understand that she would be the inspiration for that. But how do you transfer that inspiration into a song? And then when did you finally play it for her? Well, because she's because she lives here, she's probably heard that song fifteen hundred times, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know she gets to the point where it's all like a blur to her, you know. And but actually, she did make some comments on that. She doesn't always make comments on my songs, so right. sometimes I'll kind of say, you know, you haven't said anything about this song. Are you you're not you're not crazy about it? And uh, so, no, 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 I like it. I just, you know, heard it a thousand times. So, uh, because my, the studio, you can probably, I'm actually in my studio right now. Right. You can see behind me, there's no wall. Right. So there, uh, my whole family is very uh, tolerant of my music, but f fortunately my kids are musicians too. So, um, you know, I'll be mixing a song and I'll hear my son playing piano downstairs at the same time. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, and my daughter's in her room uh, playing guitar and uh, doing all that. So they're really tolerant of that. But like sometimes, like you said, I'll have to start working on it late at night or early in the morning when they're either not here or asleep or whatever. And I just try to you know, turn it down really low or whatever. And or sometimes, you know, I'll just get into something and I'll be working on it all night, literally. And uh, so then they'll come out the next day and I'll say, OK, check this out. I, I did all this stuff and I'll play it for my wife and then she'll go. Is that any different than when I heard it last night? <laughs> All right. So. Speaking of She's the One, let's take a listen to it. Ladies and gentlemen, here is She's the One. I'm just going to use that on my wife and tell her I wrote it. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. And, and she'll go, we know you don't sing. You know, <laughs> I, I am, even as a child, I, I could never, I, I, no, I'm not telling that story. Um, I, I could not sing. I was always, I always wanted to be Melvin Franklin of the Temptations and, and just do the bass part. And that, that was it. I no, I'm not standing in front of anybody. Um, what, what's, <laughs> What else is going on with you? You've got your teaching, your stuff. Um, you're, you're producing other people. What's coming up? What else is coming up for you? Well, I've got a lot of live shows coming up. I'm going to Europe uh, in a couple months. Going to do a few shows out there. I've got. I'm going to actually going to Dallas next week. Um, just. Um, yeah, a lot more live shows on the horizon. Uh, my full album will come out in April. Uh, that's going to be called Love and Rhythm. Uh, just finally finishing up the last song on that, which I haven't decided might actually be my next single in the fall, uh, or actually summer. Uh, and um, let's see, what else? Um, I uh, have a bunch of production projects lined up. Um I'll be teaching uh, the spring semester until about May. Um, and uh, that's about it. I haven't done too much TV and film for a while, but I'm always open to get back into that. Uh, other than that, that's uh, that's about it. So, so basically, when school is out, that's your mini vacation. Kind of. I mean, I'm still definitely doing my shows, and right, I'm still yeah. producing, and I'm still doing all that, but I definitely have a little bit more time when uh, college is let's, out. Let's talk about 
you're going to Europe. I, I think of the odd things. How much do you pack? How long are you gone? <laughs> How are you staying in touch with the family? Uh, well, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, you have now apps on your phone and right. all that that you can easily stay in touch. Uh, uh, my wife's from China, so she uses WeChat, and WeChat has video. It's free, so that's that's easy. Uh, but the um, uh, as far as packing, uh, it's pretty much what I have left after I pack all my music gear. Is uh, <laughs> so I'm trying to get um, smaller and smaller, but it's just it's so difficult. I have friends that I don't know how they do it. Uh, they do these shows, and uh, there's even now a guitar that they make for traveling that actually folds. No. There's a foldable guitar. It's crazy. I haven't seen it. I haven't tried it yet, but I've been, um, you know, Jonathan uh, Butler, he yeah. actually uses a foldable guitar now, um, which for, for traveling. I'm still, I don't know, I'm stubborn because I have my hollow body for jazz stuff. And mm -hmm. just like my influences over the years, um, I still, you know, play some of the, even though it's a jazz concert, there's still kind of some rock sounds that I have mm -hmm. in there, like on Europa, and I play that a lot, and people seem to love that. Uh, that's more of a rock sound on the guitar. Uh, so I have my solid body guitar for that. I've got my hollow body guitar for all the octaves and West Montgomery stuff and the jazz, or George Benson, that kind of style. So I figured out a way to, to cram two guitars into one a uh, soft case that I can take on the plane with me. Fortunately, they never really um, get wise to the, unless they're watching this right now, uh, they n never get wise to uh, the fact that there's actually two guitars because you're not supposed to take two guitars on board. It just looks wow. like one big guitar. So I usually get away with that. Um, my pedal board used to be huge that I used to take. Um, and uh, I've finally um, given up on that. And I... Uh, much smaller pedal board now that I take. So I have to take two guitars, pedal board, CDs, because people still buy CDs at, at shows, um, and and clothes. And, uh, and oh, and I have to take uh, other gear for uh, backing tracks and, and that kind of thing. So it's a lot of stuff that I got to take. I, I don't, so if I see you in the airport, I'm just going to wave. Okay. You've got you, you to carry so much stuff. Um, I, do. I, I don't, I envy you with that because I'm just trying to struggle with one bag and sometimes it's a carry on and sometimes it's not. Right. Um, Blake, we got a lot of people out here listening. Can you tell us how our listeners can keep track of you, your music and everything that you're doing? You have a social media website or something? Sure. Sure. I mean, my actual website is blakearon.com, B-L-A-K-E-A-A-R-O-N.com. Uh, Facebook, Blake Aaron Artist uh, on Facebook. Uh, Twitter, Blake Aaron Music. Uh, Instagram is also Blake Aaron Music. Uh, my daughter even set up a TikTok account for me. Of course, my, my daughter had to do that because it's like, what's TikTok? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, what else do I have? Um, those, are the, those are the main social media that I have. Oh, and I have bands in town and that kind of thing. I just, I just got that. Um, yeah, my, my, my daughter is working on my TikTok account. I go, you manage it. I, I can send you whatever you need, whatever you want. But no, I'm, I'm struggling with Facebook and, and Instagram and I will, um, I will friend you on both, um, so that we can keep up with you. And also if there's everything, anything we can do, um, that the jazz flight can do, we will do it for you. Like once the new album comes out, let us know, uh, and we'll post a bunch of different things. Oh, thanks. Like, I, I, I appreciate it. it. It is nice to meet you. Sorry about the screw up in the beginning. No, it's okay. I, I have one in front of me. I don't play. A friend of mine needed to put it someplace, and it's in front of me. In front of me, and at some point, I'm going to get another camera, because I don't think people believe all the music that I have. I still have... I don't, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Peaches record stores, and they had the display kit, not display kit, but what they put their albums in. I have five of those in front of me, and on each wall there's there's CDs. Wow! I, I like music. What can I say? Yeah. Um, but but I, I I really do like Crush. I really do. So oh, um, thanks. We will do our best to 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 push that. So once again, thank you. I appreciate the time. Um, you got it. We 
you know, we'll keep up with you. And like I said, if there's anything we can do, just let us know. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the Jazz Flight Podcast. Me, I'm Daryl Scott. Him, he's Blake Aaron. We'll hear more from him. Just keep up with everything. Blake, thank you. And we'll talk to everybody else later. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you for tuning in to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I hope you enjoy the stories and soulful melodies that grew through the doors of time. If you want to stay connected with the latest updates and episodes, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Until next time, I'm Daryl Scott.